Charles Brown was a 21-year-old West Virginia farm boy when he took off on his first combat mission in World War II, flying a B-17 bomber over Germany. He was just, it was just four days before Christmas in 1943, and while flying, he, his squadron was attacked by German fighter planes. His plane was, was, was badly damaged, um, half of his crew were wounded, his tail gunner was killed, uh, and he was left with his, he and his, his, co his co-pilot trying to maneuver this broken plane through the airs, trying to get back to a base in England. <clears throat> At one point, he and his co-pilot looked outside the cockpit window, and they were paralyzed by fear. There, hovering over their wing, was a German Messerschmitt fighter, coming in, they presumed, to make the kill. Then something strange happened. The German pilot, who they could see face to face, gave him a nod, and then continued flying in formation. Franz Stiegler was that pilot, and he knew that German anti-aircraft gunners on the ground could take out the plane at any moment. He also knew that the Germans had their own B-17 bombers, planes that were rebuilt after they captured them, if they were downed, and they used those for training. So you see, by flying in formation with, uh, with uh, Brown's plane, he was able to disguise the plane from the German gunners. They thought it was German. He flew with them back out over through the German skies, back out to the North Sea. And once he was safely out of German territory, uh, Stiegler saluted Brown and his co-pilot, peeled away and turned himself back. And he said to himself, good luck, you are in God's hands now. There's even more to this story. You see, Stiegler had every earthly reason to do exactly the opposite of what he did. First of all, he was one of Germany's top fighter pilots, and he was just one downed plane away from receiving the Knight's Cross. That's the most distinguished medal a German soldier could receive. In addition, his only brother, August, who was also a pilot, had been killed earlier that year in the war, probably by, possibly by American pilots. And American pilots like Brown were also responsible for killing many of his other comrades and bombing many cities. And then there's the death penalty. This was the price a German pilot would pay if he spared the enemy. So what on earth motivated this man to not only refrain from killing his enemy, but to actually escort him to safety? Well, you know, the account I read said this of Stiegler as he approached that wounded plane. It said, Stiegler pressed his hand over the rosary he kept in his flight jacket. He eased his index finger off the trigger. He couldn't shoot. Of Brown, that account also said he flew back to his base in England and landed with barely any fuel left. After his bomber came to a stop, he leaned back in his chair, put a hand over a pocket Bible he kept in his flight jacket, and sat in silence. Now, the article that I found, it was, it was about something called the Warrior Code, which many of you may already know. Um, it's an unspoken rule of war, of war that causes a man to refrain from killing an otherwise helpless enemy. But I believe there's, this captures something more. I believe it shows how two men who knew Christ exercised and experienced the horizontal gospel. So what is the horizontal gospel, you may ask? We're, we're going to get to that. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we go there, let, let's pray. Father God, we come before you so humble today, Lord, so in, in awe of all that you bless us with, Lord. And especially, Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, help us to treat it with all the most respect, Lord. And may your spirit work through us as we work through this this morning so that only your voice and only your truth is known. Lord, we lift this time up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the passage we're going to look at today is in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, if you want to turn there. Um, but before we get to these verses, I want to step back a little uh, and look at this, this wonderful chapter as a whole. Um, okay? Because what we, what we have to do is we have to, we have to capture what's, what's in the verses that lead up to verses 11 through 22 and verses 1 through 10. Because these, these verses create the movement um, through, you know, that continues on into the second half of Ephesians 2. Right? And so what we're going to see when we look at this as a whole 
is how the Holy Spirit, through Paul, has really masterfully captured the whole essence of the gospel. Um, now, I don't have time to go verse by verse, obviously, through uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. But I submit to you that the central point of these verses is this, that Jesus Christ, by his work on the cross and through his resurrection, reconciled the Gentiles, and in turn, all of us, to God. Put another way, because of the blood of Jesus, we can now have a relationship uh, with the Father. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What Paul's pointing out uh, here uh, to the Gentiles and in turn to us is that, is that they were once dead to God, but having been reconciled to him through Jesus Christ, now experience the surpassing riches of eternity with him. That's what we have through our Lord and Savior. So these passages are all about how through his son, the father, is gathering his people back to him. Not just the children of Abraham, he's gathering the children of Adam. And he does so by his own will, and not based on anything we have done. And everybody, I hope, knows this verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, and not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, so here we have our relationship with God restored through the gift of grace made possible by the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. And I'd say this is what we might call the vertical gospel. Through this gift, Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law that we could never achieve. But having received this gift, we have to ask ourselves, what is our response? Right? A thank you note? Starbucks gift card? No. Obviously, a much deeper thing than that. Our response, I would submit to you, is to keep the commandment on which the whole of the law and prophets depend, as Jesus put in Matthew twenty-two forty. Our response is to honor God's command that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. All right, so that's, that's a brief recap of the verses uh, 2, 1 through 9. But we know the chapter doesn't end there. And, and, and one way we want to, I would submit we can look at this is to look at that first, uh, first half of the book almost as a locomotive engine that sort of powers us to salvation, if you will. Now, an engine can easily get itself from point A to point B, all right, if that's all it's supposed to do. But if that's all it's intended to do, what's the point? The engine has two purposes, to get itself to the chosen destination and to bring the rail cars with it, right? As Calvin put it, faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. All right, so what I want to submit to you is the, first, the verses that follow up that we're going to look at today are those cars. They are that which accompanies our restored relationship with God. Uh, and now, let me push the train metaphor a little further. And hopefully it won't break down. Right. Uh, hopefully we won't go off the rails. Um, if the first half is the engine, and the second half the rail cars, verses 2.10 and 2.11 are like the couplers. Okay? They lock these two sections together. Okay, let's start with verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Okay, what I want to focus on here is that clause, created in Christ for good works. That is to say, for the purpose of good works. We weren't merely created to be saved. We were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand. That means God purposed from the beginning that believers would do good things. Okay? They don't save us but we are called to do them. This is a common theme in Pauline literature. Uh, if you look at Romans 2, 7, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. And again, in Ephesians 2, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 8, sorry, the God is, and God is able to make all grace abound in you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. All right, so... so so what we see here is that verse 10 acts as the, sort of the first half of the coupler. It's attached to the engine, okay, where verses 
2, 1 through 10. The second, no, 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 9, the second part of the coupler, attached to verses 11 through 22, comes in that very next word, the first word in verse 11, that word therefore. Okay, this, this, this conjunction indicates a result, namely, what the result of everything in the first half, verses 2, 1 through 10, should be. Paul is basically saying, as a result of our salvation and the fact that you were made for good works, our response should be what? He gives us one command. It's the only imperative contained in this whole section. He says, remember. Remember. This, it seems, is what binds the vertical gospel to what we're going to see next. Okay, so... Therefore, remember that, you, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The first thing Paul does is calls on the Gentiles to remember their state before Christ. They're called to remember two things in particular. First, they were in the flesh, and second, they were separated from Christ. In the flesh here is a phrase that Paul uses uh, quite a bit to, to, to capture the totality of the flesh, a flesh so dominated by sin that nothing good can come from it. As Paul put it in, in Romans 8, 7, the mindset on flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. This is the sinful... Uh, state that they're in. But then Paul adds this phrase about uncircumcision and circumcision. And what does he mean by this? Well, here's the point. Uh, here's, well, here he's pointing out that not only are Gentiles separated from God by virtue of their sin, they're also se- uh, outside of his covenant people by virtue of their standing. No, note that he, he calls it the so-called circumcision. In other words, this is circumcision in name only, without any meaningful spiritual connection. He uses this phrase, made by hands, um, to describe the circumcision. Interestingly, the only time you see this phrase used in the Bible is to refer to man-made idols that are worshipped in lieu of God or the temples that these idols dwell in. What Paul is saying, in essence, is that the Jews have taken what once was a godly rite, circumcision being a sign of their covenant with God, and turn the practice into an idol unto itself. Worse yet, the idol was being used to create exclusive self uh, 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 an exclusive self-defined community, as opposed to a blessing to all families of the earth that God promised through his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12.3. This, this should lead us to ask ourselves something. Are the gifts of God bestowed on us that we, are any of these, have we taken them and turned them into idols? Or do we use them to separate ourselves from our culture? Okay? That's, that's a little convicting, so we're going to move on. But think about that. The important thing to grasp here is that the Gentiles are separated from God before, uh, both by their own sin and by the judgment of those within God's covenant. They were truly destitute. Apart from Christ, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenant promise and having no hope without God, and without God in the world. Having no hope and without God in the world. Take a moment to reflect on that. If you're a believer, ask yourself this. Where would I be without the hope of God? Before you knew him, what did you cling to for hope and for purpose? Your job, your possessions, your spouse, your kids? Did you live in fear that you would lose, could lose any of these things at any moment and leave you with nothing? hopeless and without God in the world. See, Paul purposely takes his his readers and us by extension back to that dreaded place when we were separate from Christ and having no hope because we were without God. His first instruction is to remember where you came from. While we shouldn't live in the past, we also should never forget it. Why? Because the story that we lived is the story someone else is living right now. Indeed, it may be the story some of you are living today. Through our empathy, which we have by remembrance, we're able to share the experience of Jesus with those who don't know him. 
Without it, we share only the idea of him. But in our world, and especially in our area, one more intellectual idea may not be enough. Right, so having recalled their miserable state of separation from God, Paul next reminds the Gentiles of the joy uh, they have in being reconciled to God through Jesus. But he's doing something else here too that I want you to catch. He's reminding them that by his blood, Jesus not only reconciled Jews and Gentiles to God, he also reconciled these longtime enemies to one another. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Terms such as far off and near, they're, they're commonly used in the Old Testament to differentiate Gentile nations from Israel. And Paul here is drawing out this very distinction. But Gentiles are no longer far off or separated from the Jews, but rather they've been brought near, okay? The word near, egos in the Greek, is, is actually talking about closeness in terms of proximity, physically even, near even. The Gentiles are literally in the same camp as the Jews through the, their belief in Christ. Note what Paul says next. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So there's a, a lot there. But the critical theme to catch is how integrated our reconciliation to one another is with our reconciliation to God. The metaphor of the dividing wall, literally the dividing wall of separation, that's profound. Many believe, myself included, that Paul here is referring to a wall in Herod's second temple known as the Sarek. Okay? And it's the wall that divided the court of the Gentiles from the court of Israel, and thus also, obviously, the holy of holies. Um, you can see it in that picture. It's what's uh, labeled the balustrade right there um, uh, in the front. This is a powerful image, especially when coupled with what happened at Jesus' crucifixion. Matthew writes, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and rocks were split. The veil there refers to the inner curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And its tearing signified that Christ made it possible for believers to go directly into God's presence. That's you and me. See, that's the very theme of those first nine, nine verses. But directly in tandem with this, Jesus also tore down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles, signifying that this division, too, has been vanquished in him. In this universe-altering moment on Calvary, Jesus not only united believers with God, he also united them with one another. Now, the term dividing wall also has a double meaning. It also refers to the law. See, Jews in the diaspora were, were not socially distinguishable from Gentiles. Thus, their keeping of the law became the means by which they distinguished and separated themselves from their longtime rivals. Indeed, the keeping of the law of commandments became the basis uh, for the enmity or the hostility between Jews and Gentiles. It's the thing that separated them. And this is the enmity that Christ abolished through his death and resurrection. See, he intended to make the two into one man, and in so doing, establish peace. And here's the critical part. Jesus did this so that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. What should be evident to us in these verses, thus, is that Christ died for more than our personal salvation. Yes, he died for that, absolutely, praise God. But he also died for our personal reconciliation with one another. We can't be about the business of rebuilding walls that Jesus tore down through his death. And this is especially true for believers. And Jesus here is talking to two different groups of believers who are, are maintaining an ungodly animosity towards one another. They're tearing apart what God intends to be united and doing so over matters that are not spiritually fundamental. The lesson should be clear to us too. When there's division among Christians, we're outside of God's will. We rebuild walls he died to tear down. Now, I want to be clear about something, what I'm saying here, okay? I'm not arguing for so-called church unity at all costs, because there are a lot of false prophets out there masquerading as the church. 
And as you know, it is a fundamental tenet of this church that we preach and teach truth. We preach this. Nothing else. We preach this. So you're not going to hear Bibles that sort of string together some humorous anecdotes about the Bible and throw in an occasional pop cultural reference. You aren't going to hear that here. We preach truth. So I'm talking about here is not unity at the cost of orthodoxy. I'm talking about unity in orthodoxy. That said, when we as Christians become divided over matters that are not ultimate, we start rebuilding the wall that Jesus tore down. And we need to be careful about that. So whether it's the color of our skin, whether it's our politics, our position on anything related to this pandemic, whatever it may be that divides us, if it's less important than God's desire that all should be saved, it has no business coming between us. Moreover, we need to consider what our division does to our witness. Right? Have you ever been around a constantly bickering couple? How uncomfortable is it, right? They may be telling you on one hand, like, it's so important that you get married, but they're showing you on the other hand, it's so miserable being married. <laughs> and you walk away wondering, why, why would anybody do that? Why? Uh, you know, I, I think division among Christians can have that same effect. Um, they want us, the world needs us to be together. So when we as Christians are united, though, on ultimate things, we stand on common ground that is the only stable ground there is, the only firm foundation, the only rock that endures. This is the solid ground of Calvary, not the crum crumbling earth and sinking sand of, of worldly philosophy. As Paul told the church in Corinth, for since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who, be who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power of God and the wisdom of God. So in these verses in, in Ephesians 2, uh, 14 and 16, we, we come to see that as fellow believers in Christ, no matter where we came from, what we look like, what our views are on various non-ultimate issues, we are one in Christ. He has reconciled even the most bitter of, en of enemies to himself and is so doing to God and to one another. All right. Now, although this passage is, is aimed at believers, I want you to know that there's an overarching theme uh, that Jesus came also to recall, recall all people to God here. Uh, and, and, I, and Paul's reference to Isaiah 57, 19, I think carries this point. He says, And he came near and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Again, those who are far away is a euphemism for the Gentiles, as we talked about earlier. These are representatives of, that unsaved world, of the unsaved world. Today, they might be Americans, they might be Europeans, they might be Africans, they might be Asians. They may be tall, they may be short, they may be thin, they may be fat, they may be pretty, they may be homely. However we want to categorize people, Jesus died for them so that all made in God's image would through him have access in one spirit to the Father. So we talked earlier about not rebuilding walls between us that Jesus tore down. But I think it's also important to note that when we build walls between ourselves and non-believers, those are equally detrimental to God's plan. These two must not be built. And where they are, they must be torn down. I'm reminded to, of a story about a mission in rural South Africa that I, that I actually visited some years ago. It's located outside of a city called Mtata, which, like most urban areas in Africa, has a very burgeoning squatter population. People come from the rural areas to look for work, and they basically settle on any open land they can find. Well, the missionaries at this mission, they maintained fields for farming, which in turn provided their food and their income. So you can see where this is going. It was, it was, their, their whole mission was going along well until one day, almost overnight really, dozens of squatters started taking over the fields and their property. Some members of the staff went to the, the sort of the head missionary in a panic. Uh, they were feared losing everything to these intruders. Everything. Now what do you suppose his response was? What would yours have been? Panic? Anger? Fear? Resentment? Deep lament? That one at least would have been godly. <laughs> 
No, do you know what he did? He told his staff to praise the Lord. He said, we've been laboring for the Lord for years, going out time and again to search out the lost. But look what God has done. He's brought them right here to us. There you have it. No new walls, just open arms. See, it may be that some people will move into our spheres that make us less than comfortable. Don't ever assume that's against God's will. More likely it is his will. Okay, but closing, on a happier note, what Paul gives us next is this beautiful, powerful image of the church Jesus built, the church we belong to, the church that God has empowered to deliver the hope to the nations. See, the, you see these verses really are about good news, really, really good news. We should be excited. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of, the, of God in the Spirit. There are no strangers or aliens in God's household, only fellow citizens of his kingdom, fellow believers in the eternal hope Christ has given us. And that hope, God's household, is not built on a foundation of shaky earthly philosophies. It's built on the eternal truth that the prophets testified to all along, the eternal truth that the apostles gave us through the gospels and through the epistles, the eternal truth which is Jesus Christ himself, the cornerstone of our faith. The cornerstone in ancient times was this most important stone in the entire building because once you placed it, every other stone would be lined up with it. If it was off, everything else would be off. The building would be all out of whack. If it was aligned, if it was correct, everything else would be straight. Our cornerstone is more than correctly aligned. This is a blessed prayer. It is perfect. Our cornerstone is God himself. Paul concludes with this wonderful summary statement of the entire passage. First, he notes that in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Okay? This is the outcome of the reconciliation of all people to one another through the blood of Christ. We are perfectly fit together and growing into a temple of the Lord, a holy temple of the Lord. What a wonderful image. That is the outcome of what Paul describes in these verses that we've just explored. Okay? This, brothers and sisters, is the horizontal gospel. And yet he adds, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That is to say, by God's grace, through your faith, gifted by him, you individually are growing as a dwelling of God. This is the vertical gospel. Isn't it cool? How everything just fits together in our Lord and Savior. By now, be free. <laughs> okay, so by now you may be saying to yourself, uh, this is all good, uh, but what do we do with it? Well, earlier I suggested to you that the two sections of Ephesians 2 parallel the greatest commandment. That is to say, they frame up why the greatest commandment should be our ongoing response to God outworking, uh, God's outworking in our lives. So in response to the truth of our reconciliation to God through Jesus, as laid out in Ephesians uh, 2, 1 through 10, we should do this, of course. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But what shall our response be to the truth of verses 11 through 22 that call, Paul calls us to remember? The truth that Jesus, through his death on the cross, reconciled all of us to one another. There you have the reason for the second greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the question is, how are we doing with this, this horizontal gospel?